Let's get stuck in the scripture. Again, <clears throat> hear as I read this chapter, 1 Corinthians 4, all of the chapter. Have a listen and hear how the things that we've been speaking about over the last month about discipleship uh, might be highlighted in a new kind of way as we read through this, but then we're also going to look at all of it and see what would God have for us today from 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. He says this, A person should think of us in this way, as servants of Christ and managers of the mysteries of God. In this regard, it is required that managers be found faithful. It is of little importance to me that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself, for I am not conscious of anything against myself, but I'm not justified by this. It is the Lord who justifies me. Sorry, who, just, who judges me. So don't judge anything prematurely before the Lord comes, who will both bring to light what is hidden in darkness and reveal the intentions of the hearts. And then praise will come to each one from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, nothing beyond what is written. The purpose is that none of you will be arrogant, favoring one person over another. For who makes you so superior? What do you have that you didn't receive? If in fact you did receive it, why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? You are already full. You're already rich. You have begun to reign as kings without us. And I wish you did reign so that we could also reign with you. For I think God has displayed us, the apostles in the last place, like men condemned to die. We have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to people. We are fools for Christ. But you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You were distinguished, we are dishonoured. Up to the present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty. We're poorly clothed, roughly treated, homeless. We labour, working with our own hands. We are reviled. Sorry, when we are reviled, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure it. When we're slandered, we respond graciously. Even now, we're like the scum of the earth, like everyone's garbage. I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. For you have countless instructors in Christ, but you don't have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. This is why I've sent Timothy to you. He's my dearly loved and faithful child in the Lord. He will remind you about my ways in Jesus Christ, just as I teach everywhere in the church. <clears throat> now, some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. And I'll find out, not the talk, but the power of those who are arrogant. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you want? Should I come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of gentleness? Let's pray together. And Father, we need your help today as we think through these things, as we have heard your scriptures, and as we want to conform to your scriptures. Please help us have open hearts and minds to your spirit speaking to us, your scriptures, as we, again, as we come to understand them, that we would be doers of your word and not just hearers. And Father, in every way that we would live to the, to the praise of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you've been around City Light for probably more than a month or two, you will recognize, man, we, we come back to this, to parts of this chapter a lot because there are, there are so many foundational parts of how we are to do life as people who are wanting to conform to the likeness of Jesus. People want to bring glory to Jesus. who want to live as him in the world and yet be in the world. How do we live in the world and not conform to the world? If you were here for, for the rest of Corinthians so far, you know this is the thing that Paul primarily, not that he has against the Corinthians, but that he's trying to beat out of the Christians uh, in Corinth. That they were starting to synchronize with the world around them, conform to the world around them. That the, word, the world in Corinth looked like a world based in prestige. They wanted to be upwardly mobile, look really good to others. You would care what other people thought about you. That you would vie for prestige by getting more power or hanging around the powerful, but becoming wealthy and displaying your wealth, that you would look like your life was together. 
or that you <clears throat> would hang out with the best teachers, the best influencers. And if they were your instructor, they were your teacher, you had prestige by association. And they had prestige because of the caliber of the cultural elite that became their disciples or their listeners or their followers. And then Australia in 2024, we've, we've so much that echoes the culture in Corinth back in the first century. That we care what other people think about us and whether or not it was developed for this most people in Australia are on some or many forms of social media where it has become the, the primary art form of social media to project an image of your life looking amazing. It's like scripture says, <clears throat> Paul says, I don't care what you think about me. I don't, care what, I don't care your estimation of me. I don't care your judgment of me. But we have built our whole society around caring what other people think about us. That we will or won't say things because of what somebody else might think of us. Whether or not it's socially acceptable to think a thing. That we, we would spend hours carefully curating photos and tags, comments, etc to build a followership or an audience of people we desperately care what they think about us. And Paul here starts this thought, <clears throat> chapter four, by saying, I don't care what you guys think about me. Then he goes on to say, I don't, I don't really care what I think about me. Your opinion about me is not what's important to me. My opinion about me is not what's important to me. He says, not that I can think of anything that I've done wrong that you're judging by, but I'm not even justified by my own works. He says, it's God who judges me. And he, what he's not saying is, I'm just going to live my life however I like. You can't judge me, only God judges me. That's become a somewhat popular way of thinking about things. That's not what he's saying. Uh, he's saying, I'm not justified by my own works. Therefore, when I feel down, that I keep failing, I don't judge myself by my own feelings. Or when I'm doing even the thing that I think is right and you tell me it's wrong, <clears throat> that's not going to change my opinion about myself. It's not going to change my activity either. Just because I don't care what you think about me. And again, I don't care what I think about me. It says, I care about what God says about me. I'm not justified by my works. I'm not justified by you telling me I'm doing a good job. He has already justified me. If we could, I mean, the rest of chapter four is awesome, but if we could just nail that as individuals, as disciples, and as a community, holy moly people. It would, it would change most of our every day if we could get this, if we could gain this kind of understanding. Whether or not it's a bad appraisal or a good appraisal, I don't judge myself by my best day where I say, I'm doing awesome, I am great, God must love me, and I don't judge myself by my worst day, <clears throat> I am failing. I keep going back to that sin or I keep trying hard and I keep not doing the thing that I'm trying to do. He says, I don't, neither of those things, he says, that's not where I derive my identity, it's not where I derive my security, my hope doesn't come from any of those extremes or anywhere in between, but only on this solid foundation of what Jesus has already done. Christ's righteousness applied to me. That's what he is clinging to. That's what he's hoping in. And so he says, don't worry about what others think about you. He says, everything that is hidden will come to light. That's why he says, in many other places, we don't... He says, we need to pursue justice, but we don't need to pursue vindication. We, we should and can, because of its own good, we should pursue right, or, uh, justice. When there's been an injustice, we can pursue justice. It's, he's not saying don't pursue justice. He's saying we don't need to pursue vengeance and we don't need to worry. I've got to tell you, <clears throat> uh, I have, in various times in my own life, I've had various levels of kind of 
um, publicness to my life and vocation. Like when I worked in radio, uh, I had a very kind of public life. And when there was criticism, it was very public criticism. <laughs> and as, as a pastor, uh, most of what I do is just in person, one-on-one, -on -one, small groups. Uh, occasionally it is broadcast on YouTube or it's helping someone who perhaps other people in that person's life don't want that person getting particular kind of help and have had public scrutiny. People, people lie about me in public. And the, the flesh part of me goes, that is an injustice and that's not right. And I look at things like this and I consider the life of Paul and especially as he's about to lay it out. And it's a great reminder for me and for all of us that it doesn't matter what other people think about you. And everything will be brought to light. If not now, eventually. It's one of the things I love about the gospel of Jesus is that every single sin, every injustice, every wrong will be dealt with, will be paid for either by Jesus on the cross already. And so I don't, I don't bear the penalty for my own sin, but he has taken all of it upon himself. It's wonderful. It means that no injustice that I have caused will go unpunished. It also means no injustice that I have borne will go unpunished. Either Jesus has already taken that punishment or God's righteous wrath remains on the perpetrator of that injustice. And so everything will come to light. It's wonderful. God will correct every injustice. So how should we think about ourselves then? <clears throat> he helps us understand that as well. Right at the beginning, he says, a person should think of us, who's talking specifically about himself and the other apostles, in this way, as servants of Christ and managers of the mysteries of God, in this, in this regard, it is required that managers be found faithful. So he's writing to help the church understand that the important thing is what God thinks. So saying, get about the business of God, <clears throat> do that, and then only care what he thinks about you. Well, I shouldn't say only care. I should say, only shape your identity based on what he says. Be about his business in the world. Not being motivated by what will make you look good to other people. Not being motivated by what will make you upwardly mobile or will get you prestige or get you wealth or get you comfort or, or what will make life easy for you. Because if we're going through life trying to make life easy for us, as soon as there is persecution or opposition or someone laughs at you or someone says, oh, oh, I can't believe you'd say that or believe that or do that or think that, you will be tossed to and fro by every different opinion that comes your way. And Paul says, are we, we're actually managers, we're servants, we're managers, we're stewards of what God has given us. It's not even mine. I need to be careful with it, that I do with this, this hope that I have, that I would do with it the thing that pleases God who gave it to me. He wants to be faithful and found faithful with what he's given. This is a great challenge to us. To be able to say, I'm not motivated by your judgment of me and I don't even rely on my own estimation of my own righteousness. Rather, my entire hope is in the finished work of Jesus applied to me. This, this mindset will give you phenomenal freedom. Freedom from worrying about what other people are thinking about you. Freedom from trying to keep up with the latest trends or being worried about what you're going to say. I'm not saying don't, I'm not saying don't worry about offending or not offending people. Uh, we want to be, we don't want to add offence to the already offensive gospel. Let, let it be offensive. Don't us add offence to it. So I'm not saying disregard anybody's thinking. That's not what I'm saying at all. 
saying their judgment about me. I'm not worried about that. And that you would be free from your own judgment of your own self, but rather only think, what does God say about me? What's he already done? Freedom, man. Freedom to do what's right. God is inviting you into the same kind of way of thinking and the same kind of work. To be found faithful with what God has given you. That's the thing that Paul says, this is my hope, this is my plan. I mean, this is what, I, this is, this is what drives me. I want to be found faithful. He's given me something to manage. It's not mine. I didn't do it. I didn't make it. But I'm going to work it. And I'm going to be found faithful in it. And then he finishes with this line. He says, and then praise will come to each one from God. He's saying when you live this kind of faithful life, not tossed to and fro, God is pleased with you. So God says, well done. It's the praise of a loving father. He says, you did it. Well done. I'm proud of you. Well done. And we, we're invited into this way of living. We're invited into this way of life. Verse 6, Paul goes on to say, <clears throat> he has adopted this way of life. He says, actually, me and Apollos, we've applied this to ourselves. They didn't preach themselves. They didn't plant churches or make disciples to puff up their own ego. They didn't do it to acquire followers or, or become an influencer or to increase their affluence or position. Verse 6, he says, we did this so that you might learn from us the meaning of the saying, nothing beyond what is written. See, we, we wanted to preach the scripture to you. That's what we came to do. That's what we did. That's all we did. Later on in, or in, uh, well, later on, we'll get there in a couple of months. we say, I, I, I dedicated, I was not going to preach anything to you apart from Christ and him crucified. Nothing else. That's all I'm, that's everything I'm here for as a faithful steward of this gift that God has given me, this hope that God has given me that I would transparently give it to you. Not worrying what you're going to think about it, not worrying what you're going to think about me, but only as this free gift of grace from God that you would take hold of by faith. Remember the Corinthians have been falling into the dominant culture around them. They're becoming more and more like Corinth, less and less like Jesus. And so factions and divisions had been stirred up, clamoring for position and power, which is kind of what everybody else was doing around them. That pride at what they had. They were prideful about their wealth, boastful about their position, about their knowledge, about their prestige. And Paul's letting them know those, those things, that way of thinking, that doesn't come from God. I'm preaching nothing other than what is written. He's, remember saying, he's saying, remember how we pointed you to God and to the things of God. Abandon that foolish way of life. Come, come back to who God has made you to be. And then we have this, um, with this really interesting part of Scripture that <clears throat> theologians have different opinions about what's going on. Not about what Paul's trying to say. We all, everyone agrees on that, basically. Um, but the how is he trying to say it? That we have a little bit of disagreement. Verse 6, he goes, The purpose of this, of everything that I'm trying to tell you now, is that you wouldn't be arrogant. And so the next part, some people think that Paul is being bitingly sarcastic, that is so obviously over the top, dripping with sarcasm, that he's having a real crack at the Corinthian church. Or there's a plain sense in the reading which is just him saying, this is how you should be living, but you're so far from it. Either way, either way, he says, who makes you so superior? What do you have that you didn't receive? If in fact you did receive it, why do you boast as if you didn't receive it? Again, Paul's cutting right to their pride, either way you read it. He's trying to hit straight to the core, which is their pride. They were puffed up. They were living for themselves. 
They were trying to project an image of knowledge and wealth and superiority and prestige to those around them. That's what they cared about. They cared about how do I look and do people think well of me? Do people know that I am wealthy? Do people know that I have knowledge, that I'm smart, that I'm intelligent? Do people know that I hang out with all the best people? Do people know that Whatever it is that you find important or take pride in, that's not who you are in Jesus. Paul's trying to put, stack all of those things on the one side and then we'll see in a second he stacks a whole bunch of a different way of life on the other side. <clears throat> I had a great conversation this week uh, with someone who um, is doing really well in life. I had this conversation about humility. Saying, how do we pursue humility when things are going really well? This might not be your battle, by the way. But it is the battle of the people in Corinth. And when we have, I think, a right perspective of our life in Australia in 2024, especially in Adelaide, uh, Notwithstanding all of the regular difficulties of life, relational difficulties, vocational difficulties, health difficulties that are all common to everybody in the world and everybody who's ever existed, when we look, when we have that zoomed out perspective. For us in Australia in 2024, we live in one of the most peaceful times that has ever existed. And one of, my, one of the most wealthy, countries that has ever existed. One of the most, on one scale, one of the most healthy countries, people that have ever existed, in terms of longevity perhaps at least. On other scales, perhaps not. And we think we've earned it. We think we did it. Even when we work hard, because Many of the Corinthians surely had worked really hard. Uh, or their parents had worked really hard. And then they continued to work really hard and they had achieved things. And when we do th those things, when we work really hard, we study really hard or we work really hard or we take risks and some of those risks pay off and then we benefit from those risks and we can start to think, I've done this. I did this. The reason you don't have what I have is because I did the work and you didn't do the work. And Paul's trying to help these Corinthians understand. And man, this echoes hard to us in Australia in 2024. It says, how do you possibly think the stuff that you have isn't a gift from God? Even your next breath is a gift from God. The intellect you have to understand the things that you have taken to build whatever you have itself was a gift from God. The very life we have is a gift from God. But says, man, we can't lose sight of the fact that everything we have is a self a gift. And here's, here comes the sarcasm. He says, you're already full. You're already rich. You've already begun to reign, of ki reign as kings without us. And I wish you did reign so that we could also reign with you. Paul's kind of talking it up because he's just leaning into the things that the Corinthians are putting all their hope and their identity into. It's like, oh, look at you. You're doing amazing. You're rich and you're powerful and you're reigning like kings. That's the sarcastic reading. Where he's saying, you're not any of those things. He's saying, good on you. You did it. You bit and devour, devoured each other. And you got prestige. And other people think well of you. Good on you. Plain reading is, is just Paul reminding us of where true riches are found. He's saying, you're already rich. Why are you pursuing riches? You're already reigning as kings. You're already co-heirs with Jesus. Why are you clamoring for position and power? Don't you know who you are? How can we have anything but gratitude? God has gifted you 
everything you are striving for, you already have. And so Paul goes on to contrast the life the Corinthians were pursuing, and yet they already had, with the life of the apostles, the faithful life. This is, this is how Paul sets up this contrast. He says, I think God's displayed us, the apostles, in the last place. Like men condemned to die. We've become a spectacle to the world. It's just people look at us and go, whoa! Both the angels and the people. We're fools for Christ, but you're wise in Christ. We're weak, but you're strong. You're distinguished, but we're dishonored. Again, some people think that the sarcasm, the sarcasm is continuing in this section. Where he's saying, you, you have all these things, but you don't really have all those things. Yes, you sit in the position of prominence at the festivals, but only other people care about that. God doesn't care about that. That's not the thing that's achieving for us an eternal weight of glory. That's not the thing that's making disciples who will make disciples. That's not the thing that's bringing God glory with your life. It says, up to the present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty. We're poorly clothed, roughly treated, homeless. We labor working with our own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure it. When we're slandered, we respond graciously. Saying, you know how you're tossed to and fro by whatever, any, any new person's opinion of you? Do you know the people, you know the, the, the kinds of people who, whatever they believe, will just be the thing that the person they last spoke to believes? And the next person they speak to, they'll say what the last person said, and the next person will challenge that, and then they just adopt that person. Constantly changing, no anchor, no firm foundation. Paul's saying, but when people revile us, we're not tossed to and fro, we return with blessing. We don't conform to the world, we're not beaten down or, or, or beaten back from a proclamation of Jesus, a heralding of Jesus and a living for him. We're not ashamed of the gospel. We don't hold back when people yell loudly that we shouldn't be saying these things. It says instead, when we're slandered, we respond graciously. When we're persecuted, we endure it. We don't fight back. When we're called names, we don't call names again. It says we endure it and we respond with grace. He's not saying don't answer, but he's saying when we answer, we respond with the gospel. See, even now, we're like the scum of the earth, like everyone's garbage. And this word garbage uh, in the original language, it gives this uh, connotation of like the dirt you'd scrub off. Or you know when you're like scrubbing dishes, the little burnt bit that's left over? You're like, get off my dish. In, in the bin, down the drain, saying we're like that. We're the discarded ones. We're the refuse. We're the world's garbage. That's how we're treated. It says you're looking for the position of power, but this is how you're going to be treated if you're not tossed to and fro. If you don't conform to the world, the world is not going to like you. Jesus told us this. It says, why are you surprised that the world doesn't like you? The world doesn't like me, Jesus says. The world's going to kill him. That's why Paul writes to the Romans and says, man, we share in Jesus' inheritance, provided that we suffer with him, provided we're not tossed to and fro and abandon him along the way, provided we show that we are faithful stewards of what he has given us. Paul's saying, didn't we set an example for you already? Haven't we shown you the vaporous existence of pursuing wealth and power and prestige? He says, we aren't seeking prestige. People treat us like the scum of the earth, like the dirt you want to get rid of. So, but we've shown you how to live. 
And he says, I've sent Timothy there to remind you of the things that we taught you when we were there and the way that we lived when we were there with you. It's a hard word. But however you read it, Paul's not trying to shame them. How do we know this? Because the next line he says, I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. For you have, for you have many, countless instructors in Christ, but you don't have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. This is why I've sent Timothy to you. He's my dearly loved and faithful child in the Lord. He will remind you about my ways in Christ Jesus, just as I teach everywhere in the church. Man, I've preached this passage so many times or alluded to it so many times because it remains true 2,000 years later. And every time I, I read it, it's still true. Many influences trying to teach you how to live. Saying, listen to me. Paul says, I am like your father. Watch me. He doesn't say, do as I say. He says, do as I do. He doesn't say, listen to what I say and then lives however he wants to. And this has been one of the I'd say one of the hard but wonderful things about the last decade has been the number of high-profile Christian leaders who have been saying one thing and living another and it's coming to the light. And God has been cl like a cleaning house in a sense. Which from the outside makes us look like a bunch of hypocrites because that is what we are collectively when we live like this. But I think for the church and for the future of the church, this is a wonderful thing. That we don't just have teachers who say, this is what you should do. We're fathers and mothers who put their literal and figurative arms around spiritual sons and daughters and say, yes, I will teach you how to live, but I'll teach you with my words and with my life. Come and see. Imitate me. Come do what I do. He's not trying to treat, teach them abstract truths to puff them up. He, he's sharing his life with them. He's not trying to badger them or badger us into changing our behavior or to build a following or an audience or to pump up his platform. He's not trying to do any of those kinds of things. He's coming in saying, man, I'm not trying to shame you guys. I'm not trying to heap guilt on you. Jesus has dealt with all of your guilt already. Jesus has taken all of your shame upon himself already. There's, there's none left. He's dealt with it. Saying, so now let us live life together about his mission. And if you don't know what that looks like, look at me. Not up on my pedestal, but in the trenches with you. We need fathers and mothers to be disciple makers who say, live how I live. Do as I do, not do as I say. There's a call for all of us as faithful stewards that when we aren't knocked about, when we aren't bashful, that we'll be giving an example to others saying, this is how you live. Watch me get battered, hopefully figuratively. Watch me get persecuted and reply with grace. Watch me get reviled and respond with love. Watch me get, again, beat about, but endure. Come and join me. This is what Paul's saying. You can do this too. Whenever I, Beck and I, we do pre-marriage training with couples who want to get married, we love doing it. We've done it dozens and dozens and dozens of times. <clears throat> and probably every time, uh, the, the kind of the thinking or planning about kids will come up. Like, when should we have kids? And almost always, there's this thinking about with soon-to-be-marrieds and newly marrieds. I want to be ready. When I'm ready, I'll become a father. When I'm ready, I'll become a mother. 
And for those of you who are parents, you will realize probably that that is a very interesting way of thinking. <laughs> because while there may be some wisdom, for example, if there's a, a significant illness or um, since some like, you know, uh, contextual issues where it's, it makes sense to you know, delay having kids. Otherwise, just in the ordinary kind of way of things, to think, I'm going to wait till I'm ready, uh, you'll be waiting a very, very, very long time. Because what happens is, when you become a parent, you hopefully grow into being a father and a mother. It's not a thing you, you wait till you're ready. I mean, you can mature, like I'm not trying to say, you know, you just, uh, you can mature into it. Uh, but, but you'll grow into it and you'll have your first child, Lord willing, and you'll be like, I have no idea what I'm doing. And you probably suck at it for a long time. And you may think, if you're a husband, that your wife knows what she's doing. She might hope that you know what you're doing. Nobody really knows what they're doing. But you grow into it. I'm not trying to be frivolous, but I am trying to draw the parallel of, it's very similar to how we think about being a spiritual mother or father. If you just wait till you're ready for it, it's going to be a very long wait. But rather, I say step into fatherhood, step into spiritual motherhood. There are heaps of teachers. We need fathers and mothers. And you'll make mistakes and you won't know what you're doing. But like, what do I do with this screaming kid? You take care of it and they'll be like, I don't know what to do with this screaming kid. You take care of it and you figure it out. And you look to the spiritual parents who are more experienced and be discipled by them as you are making disciples. Be fathered and mothered as you are fathering and mothering. It's a thing that should set us apart as the family of God. And we're all called into it. You're probably not going to be very good at Disciple making at first. But you might love, you know, you might love that kid. You do anything for that kid, but you're not going to be a great parent from the beginning. But let that love you have for those spiritual sons and daughters propel you into growing up as a father and a mother. Taking those risks doing the things that you don't want to do or that aren't pleasant, maybe not doing the things that you do want to do because you love that kid. Regular parent stuff, this is the thing that we are each called to. Whether or not you have biological children or not, whether you're even old enough to have biological children or not, we have such a desperate need for fathers and mothers. Paul finishes his thought like this. He says, Now some are arrogant, as though I wasn't going to come to you, but I will soon come to you, if the Lord wills. And I'll find out not the talk, but the power of those who are arrogant. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you want? Should I come to you with a rod, or in love, and in a spirit of gentleness? So he's bringing it back to where are you Corinthians putting your hope and, and, and for us as well, he's saying, where do you find your hope? Why are you puffed up with arrogance as if you have something abstract of what God has already given you? Or that you've done it yourself? He says, no, 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 no. Don't put your hope in your pride and in your power. He's making a direct challenge to where that power comes from and reminding them of the true power in the gospel and the Holy Spirit. He wants to come as a gentle father who comes to have great time with his kids, not as someone who needs to come and bring discipline. Saying, don't, let's not do that. Let's do this. Let's do the fun thing. Let's be about God's business. Let's grow up into Christ's likeness. We don't want to have to do the discipline thing again. Let's do the awesome thing. And we see the power of God on display all the time. In particular, in the seemingly ordinary, mundane work of making disciples. This is the power of God. Uh, even in the last week, I've heard, uh, I've heard these stories of people in our community saying, well, this is how I 
found freedom in Jesus. This is how I, I met Jesus. Someone mothered me. Someone fathered. I had a conversation this morning with someone saying, I just went to a, a party on the weekend, uh, 70th, of a mom and a dad who parented me into the kingdom. That's how I met Jesus. Just heard it this morning. I hear it over and over and over again. There is little in the world more beautiful than seeing the power of God at work in the ordinary work of making disciples, of being fathers and mothers to the father and motherless. It's not for the special ones. It's not for Christians on a platform. It's not for the super apostles. It's for all of us. Let's pray. And so, Father, I want to thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us in Jesus that you have become our father, adopted us into your family, made us your daughters and your sons. You've dealt with all of our sin and our rebellion, dealt with all of our guilt and our shame, every stain wiped away because of what Jesus has done. And so, Father, help us. We don't want to be arrogant we don't want to be puffed up. We don't want to think of ourselves more highly than we are. We don't want to think that we have earned anything. Not by ourselves, not abstract of you and, and the gift that you've given us. But Father, I'm asking, help us to be a people who do work hard. Not to strive for something we already have. But to bring you glory with our lives. To see many more daughters and sons come into your kingdom. Father, help us to not be uh, tossed to and fro by opinions and waves of culture, but to be steady and steadfast, faithful in our service of you and what you've given us and who we are, that we look to you for our identity and not to anything else. Look to you for your judgments and not to any, anything or anyone else. Not even, our, not even our own estimation of ourselves. Father, please help us to grow up into your Holy Spirit, into the likeness of Jesus in this way. And help us to love one another deeply from the heart as family, as brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, sons and daughters. Lord, we do, we do want to grow in knowledge, but not just for knowledge's sake so that we can be better fathers and mothers. And so my request today is for fathers and mothers among us. We wouldn't wait till we're ready, but we would, we would go <laughs> uh, gloriously into that unknown and spiritually parenting people who are both near and far to you so that they might look at our lives and grow closer to you. Father, we are, we are hopeful, not in our own righteousness, uh, but in Jesus' finished work and our participation in your work in the world. We're looking forward to that well done, good and faithful servant. And, and the reward... But most of all, we want to bring you glory with our lives. We want to know you. We want to be with you. We want to be like you. We're asking all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.